Hey, good morning once again, FCF. This is day three, I believe, of our journey, our eight-day journey. As we're looking at some of the big events in the early Old Testament, we started with creation. Last week we looked at uh, the deception and the fall of mankind. Today we're going to take it about 15 year, 1,500 years from that last event. Um, really tough you know, sledding when it comes to chronology, these things. You know, Adam and Eve somewhere, 4,000 B.C., who knows, can't be really, really sure of that. But it's roughly from the last event where Satan deceives them and they begin to distrust God to the point that we're going to pick up in today, which is in Genesis chapter 6. It's around 1,500, maybe even 1,800 years. Now, I want you to picture something. If you're reading your Old Testament much, you know that these people are living to be extraordinarily old, long lives, and they were having lots and lots of children. So, in this 15 to 1800 year period, a tremendous population explosion had happened on planet Earth. It's really tough to say how many people were there now, but because of the extraordinarily long lives and you know large families, there could, there could have been millions of people on the planet at this point. Let me pick up reading for you now. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, pause one minute, this term, sons of God, in the Old Testament, it is only used in one way. It is only speaking of one type of being. It is not speaking of humans. Sons of God in the Old Testament, it's only used of angels. So we're talking a whole different species here. It's very important you get that part. So let me, let me start again. It says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, the angels, saw that the daughters of men, notice the distinction, sons of God as opposed to daughters of men, were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God, that's the angels, went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, the men of renown. Pause for just a minute. you got to take this in because this is, this is phenomenal. We saw the first big angelic attack in the Garden of Eden when Satan, who is an angel, probably one of the highest ranking angels, deceives and seeks to destroy mankind, seeks to destroy God's purpose, slander his character um, in the universe. Now we see a second great angelic incursion. This time it's a biological one. These angels can take on, they can morph their form, they can take on human form. Often in Scripture, um, there will be someone that later is described as an angel, but they look very human initially. Anyway, these angels were taking on human form. They were finding attractive human women, and then they were mating with them, having children, and their offspring were something Scripture calls the Nephilim. We get descriptions of them further on. These things were freaks. They, they were not human looking. They were essentially half human, half angel. But the biological distortion that came out was shocking. They were gigantic creatures. Many times they had six fingers, six toes. Um, we, we can only wonder what they were like. Many of the megalithic structures that we see scattered all over the world, we can't help but to believe it was probably these beings, this, this offspring, uh, you know, this hybrid offspring race that was perhaps the creators of these megalithic structures that we could hardly do today with our modern equipment. Anyway, picture it. Huge population explosion, angelic incursion. These angels are multiplying with human women. They are producing a, another species on the planet. They've broken this very uh, strong boundary that God had uh, put on the planet. And let's see what the result was. So we're picking up in Genesis 6 now, verse 5. It says, the Lord God, excuse me, it says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. I want you to hear that again. When God observed that 
there was wickedness on the earth and that his thoughts were only evil all the time. It says the Lord was grieved. It, it broke his heart, in other words, that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. Uh, let me just drop you down to verse 11 and we get an additional insight of what the earth was like. It says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. So this is the portion of Scripture where Noah is introduced. Now here's the interesting thing about Noah. When we read about him, it says that, that he was the last. He was the last man that trusted God, the last righteous man. He may, he may have been one of the last genetically pure uh, men on the planet. That's speculative to be sure. But this is a terrible point in human history. After only 15 to 1800 years from Adam, now we have the, the corruption of the human gene pool, or at least the attempt of it, and it's creating a world that is full of insane evil, and, and with evil always comes violence. Because evil always just takes. It does not give. So this is where God, who it says is grieved in his heart, is heartbroken, he knows he has to intervene. Noah's the last chance. He's the last righteous man. He sends Noah on the mission. You know the story. He builds the ark. It takes 120 years. And he and his family are the, and the animal life are the only ones that are saved. And so God, he's rescuing the human race. He's not angry and punishing the human race. He's rescuing us before there would be no righteous seed or no righteous lineage left. And Satan would have done a complete destruction job on the human species. So I hope every time you think about the flood story again, you'll think about this in a very different way. It, it, it's, a, it's a tragic incident, and it also gives us a glimpse into the heart of God. When he sees the wickedness and when he saw the violence, it broke his heart. And so he intervened, not in anger, he intervened as the only way necessary to save the human race. Thank you, and we'll pick up again tomorrow.